Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of Espadare Street by Ian Banks. Dane reads. So, funny story with this book. It was recommended to me by a poet friend of mine called um, Nigel, uh, Nigel Cresswell. And then it was also recommended to me by Ken Boyter, K.R. Boyter, who's uh, another author friend. But as well as being an author, he's a medium. And while I was interviewing him, uh, the spirits apparently wanted to tell me to read this book, which... I thought it was a good enough reason to check it out. So, as always, I'm going to read the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs before I share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. Two days ago, I decided to kill myself. Last night, I changed my mind and decided to stay alive. Everything that follows is just to try and explain. Daniel Weir used to be a famous, not to say infamous, rock star. Maybe still is. At 31, he has been both a brilliant failure and a dull success. He's made a lot of mistakes that have paid off and a lot of smart moves he'll regret forever, however long that turns out to be. Daniel Weir has gone from rags to riches and back, and managed to hold on to them both, though not to much else. His friends all seem to be dead, fed up with him, or just disgusted, and who can blame them? And now Daniel Weir is all alone. As he contemplates his life, Daniel realises he has only two problems, the past and the future. He knows how bad the past has been, but the future, well, the future is something else. So this is basically like a memoir of a fictitious uh, band. I'm going to read the intro to chapter one here, because this goes into sort of a bit more detail from that, that's uh, excerpt on the blurb. Two days ago I decided to kill myself. I would walk and hitch and sail away from this dark city to the bright spaces of the wet west coast and there throw myself into the tall glittering seas beyond Iona with its cargo of mouldering kings to let the gulls and seals and tides have their way with my remains and in my dying moments look forward to an encounter with Staffa's six-sided columns in Fingal's cave. Or I might head south to Corrie Vrecken to be spun inside the whirlpool and listen with my waterlogged deaf ears to its mile-wide voice ringing over the wave race. Or be born north to where the white sands sing and coral hides pink-fingered and hard-soft beneath the ocean swell and the rampart cliffs climb thousand foot above the seething acres of milky foam, rainbow buttressed. Last night I changed my mind and decided to stay alive. Everything that follows is just to try and explain. Memories first. It all begins with memories the way most things do. And this is something I relate to, this is sort of similar to my own experience of growing up. He says, I grew up, I ended grown up, lacking so many of the standard props. A watch, a wallet, a diary, a driving license, a checkbook. And not just the props, not just the hardware, but the brain implanted software to make use of them. So that even when I did end up with all that gear, I never really felt it was part of me. Even after Inez bought me the Rolex, I'd wander up the roadies and ask them how long we had to the start of the gig. The record company gave me a Gucci wallet, but I'd still stuff pounds and fivers into various pockets. I'd even cram them into the back pocket where I put my wallet, absolutely wondering why it was so difficult to squeeze the crumpled bits of paper in there. And I just thought this was, you know, another thing I kind of related to from this character. I never did give a damn what other people thought of me, but somehow I was still worried like hell about it. I never expected to be loved, but I never wanted to hurt anybody either, and that meant trying to be nice and generous and kind and supportive, and generally behaving as though I was desperate to be loved, and for myself, not for my work. He's talking about an area of Paisley in Scotland, he says, it was a toss of which were the most broken, the families or the houses. Sounds like Macefield Drive in Tamworth, where I grew up. And then he goes to see the band that he ends up joining as like the principal songwriter, and he says, I came to be cynical, and for the first 30 seconds of the Bowie song I was, just because I was a hopeless musical snob and Bowie was too commercial for my taste. They were on more credible ground for me with the Stones and the Zeps, but that feeling didn't last long. I ended up stunned. They were doing just by playing what I wanted to do by writing. There were rough edges, sure enough. They weren't all that tight. The drummer was more enthusiastic than his skills would let him get away with. The guy with the hammer seemed to want to show it off rather than play with the rest of the band. And the chick's voice, though it was technically good and powerful, sounded too polite. Classical training, I decided immediately, trying hard to find something analytical to hold on to. Great line here from uh, McCanny says, I'm not a cynic, Jim. Cynicism is for the rich. Us poor punters are just cautious. Can't afford to be anything else. Cautious and no so stupid. And then later on he says, um, McCann, on the other hand, had once told me that when he was younger and running with a gang, one of the little tricks they used was to sew fish hooks behind the lapels of their jackets, so that if anyone grabbed them there to headbutt them, they'd get a nasty surprise. And then another bit of wisdom from McCann, he says, if you're rich, you're just eccentric. If you're poor, you're a nutcase and they stick you in the bin. And I thought this was cool, so the band that he ends in is it's called Frozen Gold, and this is like how he kind of writes one of their signature tunes. It's a terrible name, they wouldn't take any of the names I suggested, but I thought if we have to have that name, then what can we do to turn it into an asset, you know? Something that'll work for us. So I took the letters of the two, two words, right, F and G, and just tried strumming the two chords, one after the other, and it sounded alright, it sounded really good. So they formed the start of the song, you see. That'll be the first thing you hear on the album, F, G, our code, you see. Our theme tune, sort of. Not as clever as back using B, A, C, H, but it's clever, isn't it? 
It's the sort of thing that gets you publicity, see? Because it gives people something to write about or mention on radio programs. Makes people remember the name, too. How did Bach use B-A-C-H when there's no musical note H? It only goes up to G. Is that supposed to be the joke? I don't, I don't know. And then there's a dog called TB, uh, which means a total bastard. Um, and he like drinks, he's drinking beer out of an ashtray, basically. But uh, this is a little bit of, uh, I mean, I kind of relate to this because I've not I quit drinking last September, and it says, uh, "Drink is bad for you. It's a drug, a poison." Of course, I know that, don't we all? It just so happens it's legal and available and accepted, and there's a whole tradition of enjoying it and suffering the consequences, even boasting about the consequences. And that tradition is especially strong here in Scotland, and especially in the West, and especially in Glasgow and surrounding areas. You don't realise like how glorified booze is in society until you stop drinking it. Another great little line here that's very true. Pedal one of the least harmful drugs humanity's ever discovered and you get 20 years. Pedal something that kills 100,000 a year and you get a knighthood. Yeah, I know, Biggie. We get a reference to a Tom Waits record, although Waits is spelled wrong. Just put an E in it. And it's talking about the middle classes and this makes me feel kind of middle class, he says. They were looking at least four or five albums and maybe the same number of years ahead. That's real forward planning. That's middle class thinking. That's looking ahead. The middle classes are brought up like that. They get salaries they make last all month. They'll take out life assurance without getting the hard sell. They'll invest in the future. They'll buy a wee stupid car so their kids can go to a good private school. And it makes good sense anyway, so economical. They can keep drinking the house without having to drink it all. Not like you're working class at all. If you've got it, spend it. If it's there, drink it. Hence the weekly wages and the local off license. And here he's talking about how much, because oh, he's quit smoking, he says, ah, the following fornication fag, the postcoital cigarette, the apre orgasm gasper. That's the one I miss most of all. Every time Betty lights up, I think just one, just one now for old time's sake, it's allowed. Your conscience would understand. But then I think about how I'd feel later. The big G again, rearing its siren head and wanting to be fed. The big G being his guilt almost personified, you know? Basically, he's sleeping with this prostitute and he, and he says, her best story, the one that makes me most angry, but one that she tells with a sort of baleful irony, is at the time she was sent down for three months for soliciting by a judge who'd been one of her clients. I was incensed. I'd always regarded the law on prostitution to be almost as stupid, almost as guaranteed to bring law in general into contempt as the law on drugs, with the laws they still have on homosexuality running a distant third. But to discover an act of such gross, such focused hypocrisy being perpetrated on somebody I knew and liked made the arrant nonsensicality of our supposedly shared values far clearer for me than they ever had been before. I wanted to get that judge's name and expose him. Get him somehow. Betty couldn't understand why I was so angry. She told me to stop being daft. Occupational hazard. She'd met worse bastards than that. I think she decided then not to risk telling me about some of the really bad experiences she's had in case I took after some violent client with an axe. And he ends up unable to use the number five for like his deep-seated psychological reason. Basically on his fifth birthday, his dad came home and beat his mum up. And it says, um, took a school psychiatrist two years and a lot of patience, anti and biscuits to worm that out of me. I wouldn't think about it. I couldn't remember anything anywhere near my fifth birthday. I had terrible nightmares about being chased by a lion or a bear or a tiger and being beaten and mauled before I died slash woke up. But I wouldn't remember anything about that birthday. By the time I was persuaded to dig up that memory, my dad was safely in Barlini prison. Killed a man. Nobody in particular, just a guy who annoyed him one night in a bar and who happened to have a thin skull. Hard luck, really. He'd been a regular visitor to the local Nick since before I was born for stealing assault, always when he was drunk. Not really a violent man, just a stupid one, a weak one. He knew he became belligerent when he drank, but he always thought that next time it would be different and he'd stay in control. So he kept on getting drunk and he kept on getting violent and he kept on getting into fights and he kept on getting sent to jail. He tells a joke about his life, his daddy says, uh, my dad went to the University of Life, but he kept getting sent down. And I thought this was funny. He goes, product, geez, the buzzword of the century. Everything's product. Music is product. Product produced by producers for the industry to sell to the consumers. I don't think anyone has quite had the nerve yet to refer to paintings as product. Yeah, except as a put down perhaps, but it must be on the way. They'll quote the works of dead painters on the stock exchange. Picasso's blue chip period, gilt edged frames. So yeah, Espadare Street by Ian Banks. I gave it probably, oh, it's a strong 3.5 out of 5 or a weak 4 out of 5. I think I'm gonna go with a weak 4 out of 5. Um, Ian Banks, uh, he, there's just something about it. It's like a watered down Irvin Welsh, at least in this book. And I've also read The Bridge by him. And again, it was okay. It's just, it doesn't, it, he's not blown my mind yet, but he's one of those authors who I think I probably should really like. So I am gonna give him another chance. And um, yeah, I'll get to some more of his stuff soon.
So there we have it, that's what I made of Espadare Street by Ian Banks. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.